Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, a very warm welcome to our session this evening, which is going to relate to surviving lockdown number six. Uh, I'm coming to you from Wurundjeri land and I pay my respects to elders past, present and future. I'd like to start this evening by um, acknowledging the work of the parents. The year and particularly this term has thrown some challenges to all of us and certainly to our beautiful school. And can I say that if it weren't for the fabulous support of the community generally, doing what needed to be done, uh, doing what was hopefully considered right, uh, it meant that we have uh, survived and to many levels in, in some ways thrived and uh, been able to move forward. So a huge thank you to you, the families that are out there and for everything that you have done and continue to do. It's my great pleasure tonight to introduce a couple of people. We have uh, Bianca Moran, Miss Moran, who has been with us for a couple of years now, one of our sites. We also have Dr. Michelle Andrews-Luke and Michelle joined us partway through term two. Both these fabulous women have uh, immense experience in areas of youth mental health, both within the education system and more broadly. So look, a warm welcome to both Michelle and Bianca and thank you for coming tonight. I might add that they both have little children and uh, well, one of them has got slightly older children as well, but um, they uh, are coming at this whole space from a parent's point of view too. And I'm sure you'll find their understanding of the situations to be very genuine and hopeful. Hopefully their information to be really important and helpful. We've also got uh, uh, Mrs. Sayer, Louise Sayer, the head of junior school, who's there. Hi, Louise. And uh, the deputy principal, Stephen Middleton, Dr. Middleton is here as well, as is Mr. Halsey. So look, we might get started. I would ask people if you could please to mute your mics uh, just to reduce any interference that may crop up. Uh, it's fair enough to say that we've received a couple of questions previously, so I'm going to be the moderator or MC if you like, but uh, could I encourage people please to feel free um, to put any further questions in the chat on the side of the screen, the little bubble, thought bubble at the top, if you're not sure where it is, and uh, we will try and get to those questions as well. But we have received uh, a few questions. So we're going to kick off straight away. Um, I will acknowledge that current situation seems a little bit different to lockdowns that we have been through before. And, uh, and as always, situations are out of our control. So that is a particular source of, I think, stress for some of us. I'm going to start by asking Bianca, if I may, basically on that, that this lockdown somehow does feel harder. Um, why, why does it feel harder than the previous ones, do you think? Um, thank you, Annette. Um... I think there can be multiple different reasons why it's feeling harder, but I think, I think partly it's due to the, the quickness of it. Um, I only heard at about one o'clock some mutterings and then by four o'clock the announcement and eight o'clock we're all closed down. So I think the speed hasn't been helpful because it's all sort of just uh, suddenly landed upon us. Um, and the day before we had zero cases. So I think there's a, a, a few um, Things that it's been rushed, but also we've been through a lot. We're, this is lockdown number six, and I think we're getting tired of them. We're sick of it. Um, we, I think for most people, we just want life to just keep going as normal. Um, and it's the frustration of having to, oh, we've got to stop everything. We've got to readjust how we think, how we operate, um, how we just run normal everyday life. And we'd like it to be predictable and something that we um, can expect, but it, it gets flipped on its head more well, like two weeks. Oh, it was a week after, wasn't it? It was very mm -hmm. quick. I lose track of time too. That's part of the problem as well with lockdown. We all lose track of time and it becomes very, um, yeah, very unsettling. And they're probably going to go on these lockdowns, aren't they? We, well, I hope they don't, but I get, I'm guessing they might. So what, to, you know, is, is there anything that we can do that might help us deal with that there's sudden changes and sudden situations that are foisted on us. Look, it's hard. It's really hard to manage with when things are suddenly thrown at us. I think um, 
I've been speaking to lots of different people and today I was speaking to some other parents and they were saying that um, they had a good cry last week. They just got really annoyed and had a good cry. And I think that's okay. It's okay to say, I don't want to do this again and it's unfair and, and get really upset. I got really angry because I was just sick of it. I'm sick of having to go in lockdown and, and juggle the working from home and having kids and homeschool and all of that. And I think I think most people are in that situation that we're over it. But then it's also working out how do you cope with it? How do you manage with it? What regular things do you put in place that become your routine when you're at home um, that, are, that are different things to when you go to school? I was And another parent I was speaking to today was saying that um, they go for walks in the morning they get up early and go for a walk and get a hot chocolate and then they come home and do school which I think is such a delightful idea because usually we can't do that we're rushing around but I think that's such a delightful thing and for the young person it was it's working really well so it's thinking of creatively and trying to do some of those sort of different things. Mm. And look, that sort of leads into the next question, which is for Michelle. And you've touched a little bit on this. You know what, Michelle, what are some typical child emotional behavioural responses to something like this COVID pandemic? Thank you, Annette. I think um, one thing that we do know is that children can be vulnerable to the, the psychological impact of COVID-19 and the pandemic. And that's really all about their really strong need for safety and for security. Um, and we also know that children, like all of us, we they respond to stress in different ways. So some children might be anxious or, or worried, and they might be worried about contracting the illness themselves, or maybe their family members or their friends contracting the illness. Um, some kids might also experience difficulties with attention and concentration and paying attention to their schoolwork. And, and so um, you might be seeing or just noticing that your kids are, are daydreaming um, a lot more than usual. Um, some kids might also be irritable or agitated and frustrated. And so you might have found uh, parents, you might have found during the pandemic that your kids are having more arguments than usual, maybe with yourself or um, perhaps uh, with their siblings or other people and your kids, you might have noticed throughout the pandemic that they've been having more meltdowns than usual. Um, some kids might feel sad and they might just want to be alone. Um, now I'm an educational and developmental psychologist and so I often um, think about children's developmental stages and ages when I think about these sorts of things. And so when I think about preschool age children, um, they're much more likely to, during these times, these stressful times or challenging times, they're much more likely to regress. And what that really, it just means that they're more likely to begin acting younger than their age. So preschool age kids, they might use baby talk um, when they're talking and they might also be clingy and want to stay by your side parents and they might also have sleep problems like problems falling asleep or maybe having more nightmares um, than they might usually have. Um, when I think about primary school aged kids they might for example they might be more um, frightened when they're seeing images of people in protective gear um, on TV and they might also ask lots of questions and and I guess one thing that I, I, I've been thinking about um, a lot is that kids and children, what they do, they process their lives and what's happening around them and they process challenging and stressful experiences through drawings and through play. Um, and so, for example, throughout the pandemic, you might have seen parents, you might have seen your children playing the same games over and over again, um, things like hospitals and things like that. Um, I have to say that throughout the pandemic, um, when we've been in lockdown, our various lockdowns, my three primary school aged children have been building lots and lots of forts inside our home. Um, and I'm pretty sure they're doing that because it really helps them to create a really lovely safe place or space and a very predictable haven. And I think it really also helps them to feel in control and it gives them lots of physical comfort. So today, my youngest child, my son, he created a fort that was filled with pillows and teddies. And I think we all need that. We all need that physical comfort right now. And I guess 
what I'd like to emphasise in response to that, the question is really that these are um, what I've been describing are all really natural responses to an extraordinary situation, those challenging behaviours that I've been describing. And so it's really important for us as parents to um, avoid punishing those types of challenging behaviours because right now our kids really need for us to be responding in a really supportive and loving way. Uh, following on, and I, I'm sure some of the parents listening are thinking of this, I know I am. So is that regression reversible? What what kind of happens when we do get back to whatever normal is? I think it is reversible. It will Children will go back to normal. So I would, um, I guess, just reiterate that it's a normal response to a stressful situation and they will grow out of that. Mm. So in terms of, you've sort of touched a little bit on this then. So active things that parents can do that yes. will help their children as they move through this period? I think, um, yeah, I've got lots of ideas and I think the good news is, is that we can do lots of things as parents to help our kids to cope during the pandemic. I think um, firstly, one thing that we can do is provide our kids with age appropriate information about what's happening um, and about the pandemic. And we can do this by telling our kids the facts. Um, and importantly, telling the kids the facts um, appropriate to their developmental level. Um, and we can also read books about COVID to our kids. Um, you probably already know um, the parents out there listening that there are a whole lot of children's books about COVID that have already been published. Um, you might have already seen, I've got a copy of it here. I love this book. Um, it's a picture book called Coronavirus, a book for children, and it's illustrated by Ax Axel Scheffler, who many of you will be familiar with, and you can actually download this book for free. Um, it was created at the beginning of the pandemic last year, so a little bit of it's dated, but you know, having said that, it's a beautiful book um, that just, it really gives the facts in a very clear and easy to understand way. Um, and we can also remind our kids of all of those things that we can do to stay safe. Um, things like social distancing and wearing masks, and that's described really beautiful in this book. Um, another thing that we can do as parents is we can try and minimise our kids' uh, television um, and media viewing. Um, because they might not understand the frightening images, the images of people in hospital and things like that, that they're seeing. Um, and I think that what's probably most important when it comes to helping our kids to cope during um, the pandemic is to respond to our kids in a really supportive way if they're feeling worried and to really listen to our kids and to validate their feelings. Um, when it comes to validating feelings. Um, I often talk to parents about what's called emotion coaching. Um, now the concept of emotion coaching, it was developed by a psychologist in the US called Dr. John Gottman. Um, and I've got a copy of his book here with me. It's called, um, where he talks a lot about emotion coaching. It's called Raising an Emotionally Intelligent Child. Um, and in it, um, he talks about emotion coaching and he talks about the five steps of emotion coaching and and really um, it's really all about building strong relationships with our kids and the first step in this process or this approach is to tune in to our kids emotions and to tune in when the emotions are at a lower a lower intensity and that's really the ideal time for us as parents to coach our children through their feelings before they intensify or escalate um, because that's when our kids are really, they're still calm enough to be able to think through the situation. Um, and so I'm sure the parents out there, you're already doing this, but really what it involves is really looking for signs, um, signs of sadness or irritability or grumpiness. Um, and you all know these parents that, you know, the common ways that our kids show their those lower intensity emotions, they're all in their facial expressions, like their posture, you know, they might be sighing or grumbling. Um, so that's step one, tune into their emotions. The second step in the emotion coaching um, approach is 
to, as parents, view our kids' emotions, their expression of their emotions, um, and that that process, the situation, um, as being an opportunity for us to um, connect with our kids and to teach them. So when we see our kids starting to become irritated, um, we might say to ourselves, you know, this is a moment for connection and for teaching our children. Um, the, the, the next step in the process is really to actively communicate with our kids that we understand and we accept their emotions. Um, now, sometimes as parents, we can sometimes view our kids' emotions as unimportant and we might try and dismiss them, um, especially negative emotions. But the problem is um, when we don't view our children's emotions as an opportunity for connection and for teaching and when we don't communicate our understanding and our acceptance, what we do then is we send our kids the message that emotions are silly and that they're unimportant. Um, and then our kids never have the opportunity to really learn from us about how emotions actually work and how to respond to emotions in healthy ways. Um, the fourth step, so I'm up to number four now, is to help our kids to use words to describe what they're feeling by reflecting their emotions. And really all that's about, um, when I talk about reflecting emotions, it's about simply stating what we're seeing, what we think our children are feeling. Um, so yesterday when I um, told my three kids, when the news came through that the lockdown was extending, um, I could see that they were really disappointed um, and they felt that they just said to me, mum, it's not fair. Um, and so I said to them, you know, it's so hard and it's really frustrating, um, especially, you know, when you're not able to see your friends. Um, so that's what reflecting emotions is really all about. And when we do this, what happens is our kids then, um, by verbalising what they're feeling, they start to work out for themselves how they feel. And I often use the phrase, if we name it, then we tame it. So if we can name the emotion, if we can say, I can see you're really frustrated, that helps our children um, to in, in, internally to tame those big feelings um, rather than to become hijacked by their feelings. So it's really powerful to do that. Um, and I guess um, another, I think what I would say is a really powerful strategy at this point in this approach that I've been describing is to consider just sharing um, at, an, at a developmentally appropriate level how you as the parent might be feeling. So, you know, I've said to my kids yesterday when, or I said to them yesterday when the lockdown was, um, it was announced that it was going to be extended that, you know, I really miss my friends and I'm feeling really sad that I can't see them. And when we do this, um, when we do it in this way, it really helps our kids to feel understood and respected. And that's so important when it comes to helping them regulate their emotions in a really healthy way. Um, so the fifth and final step, I think, and I should emphasize that this isn't always essential, um, but if necessary, we can then help our kids to solve problems or to work collaboratively with our kids to solve any problems that might be affecting them. Um, so for, in my case yesterday, afternoon after I acknowledged you know how frustrating it was um, for my kids because they can't see their friends um, easily um, we did some problem solving together you know just to try and work out what are some um, ways for them to connect with their friends and what we've come up with is that we'll go to um, one of our local playgrounds um, on the weekend which is within our five kilometer limit um, and that we'll be able to see some friends there and you know, there's been a lot of research done by Dr. Gottman and other, others about the benefits of this type of uh, way of relating with our kids. And there are many, many benefits. Um, parents find that the, those challenging behaviours, they'll often decrease. And I think that's for a number of reasons. I think that when we respond to kids' emotions at a lower intensity, um, that means that those emotions are responded to sooner or attended to sooner. And so what that means is they don't escalate um, and our children don't feel the need to escalate their behaviour. Um, the other thing is, I think when we're doing this, our kids become really practised 
um, really well practiced at self-soothing, so they're more likely to stay calm. Um, and I, I also think it's important just to add that emotion coaching parents, they don't disapprove of their kids' emotions, so there are fewer points of conflict. And what I would say is most important, the best benefit, is that um, this way of relating to our children um, helps to create really strong emotional bonds. Um, and what that also means is that when we have those bonds, our kids are more responsive to our requests and they're much more cooperative. Um, and I just want to add, I know I've been talking quite a lot, but one other thing that I think is just really, really important is that um, I think a really important part of being um, an emotion coaching parent is to create or to make space or times to be able to have um, conversations with your kids to talk about emotions. So to actively provide or create these opportunities. So, you know, in my family, that time is usually that time just before bed. Um, and I talk a lot with preschool or parents of preschool age kids and they often say, you know, they're, they're not sure how their kids will go um, at such a young age, but I would say without exception, um, you know, they, they do, parents of preschool age kids do tell me, you know, that it does work. And sometimes they're surprised that they can actually manage these conversations. Um, and what I would say is that these conversations, they really foster our children's sense of being respected and they feel seen and capable. Um, and I know I've been talking a lot, but I've got one more thing quickly just to say, which is that I think that um, all children are unique. And I think this is really important to emphasize all kids are unique and all families are unique. And all of us, we're all experiencing this pandemic um, and this particular lockdown number six in our own unique ways. And you, you parents listening, um, you know your children best and your families best. Um, so I just encourage you to find your own ways um, to tune into your children's emotions. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Look, um, a, a question that pops into my mind is that uh, if there are some parents listening who, you know, that's fantastic advice you've given, but, you know, we are lockdown number six and for some of our families and um, I have five kids and I mean, they're a lot older now, so it's not such a problem for me, but I'm sure there are families out, um, out there that they have maybe not done some of the things we've just been talking about, that yeah. there's some negative relations or well, more negative relationships that are building up. How might you, um, salvage might be too strong a word, but how might yeah. you kind of bring it, bring it back if the child has now just completely shut off or is beginning to shut off from the family? Um, thank you for asking that, Annette. I think, um Lots of parents are asking me um, or have asked me similar questions throughout the pandemic at different points, including more recently. Um, and they'll often ask me, what's my top tip? You know, like if I could bring it down to one thing that's the most important thing and that can really help them to um, repair any ruptures. Um, and I would say that my number one tip right now is that it's just so important for us as parents to create opportunities to be together with our children and to play together and to have fun together and to relax together. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, our kids use play to process their emotions. And if they're having a stressful time um, and if there's been ruptures in our relationship with our children, play. Um, and having fun, especially any types of play or activities that involve uh, physical movement and activities, that can really help us to reduce stress. It can help them and us to reduce any feelings of stress that we might be feeling. Um, and it can also help us to strengthen the bonds that we have with our children. Um, and I would say, um, that really play of any type. And when I say play, I mean, um, doing lots of things. In my house, we have what we call dance offs. So we just put some um, music on all of our favourites and just dance. And that's with my um, six year old right up through to my 12 year old daughter. We just dance together. And I think that doing it together and having that physical activity, as I said, it helps to reduce any stress that we might be feeling. It helps us to feel calmer. 
but most importantly, it helps us to feel more connected with each other. Yeah. Uh, can, thank I you. Add, can I add a little bit, Annette? Um, I, so we've been doing similar at our place. We've been um, we've sort of been having a, a, a daily soccer kick the ball to each other or going for a bike ride or doing something physical. Um, but I, th I think also something that, that when, when you're trying to regain connection with young people, it's about connecting with something that is of their interest. So um, I, I note that there's a question about any tips for older kids. Um, it's, for me, it would be you sit down with them and have a movie um, sit and, and share or watch a favourite TV show, something you can laugh about and you could talk about and pick it apart a bit, but connecting with you, your young person in a way that, or like on their level and something they're interested in. You might not be that keen on the TV show, but you will oh, you'll get so many brownie points from your young person if you sit there with them watching whatever show they're wanting to do so you connect with them. Um, and, then it's, and then it's a way in. It's a way in to start repairing that relationship and, and connecting with them. So it does vary depending on the age of, you, of your child. Um, but yeah, something back just that we were t you were talking about a bit earlier, um, something that I think um, because there's so much change and so much unpredictable, unpredictability, it's about, I think one of the challenges is to make things quite predictable at home and have a really good routine in the household. Um, we've set up a very, um, a, a pretty clear routine of, of sort of sticking to the regular way that a school day would work. Um, and having morning tea at the same time and lunch. Um, our, the way that my kids' school works is a little bit different to St Margaret's and Barrett Grammar, but um, it, it's important to have those regular routines and sitting down and having meals together as a family, great way of connecting with each other um, and sharing something together and having a bit of discussion about your day and, and how things are going can be a really nice way of connecting. I'm going to, there are some questions about, you know, returning to school and how to manage that, but I'm, I'm going to defer to one of our parents' questions who started by actually saying thank you to the marvellous teachers. So thank you to that person for thinking of the teachers. Um, and they comment that I've no quote, I've noticed a shift in the younger year levels enjoyment and attitude towards enjoying school due to online learning. Uh, in other words, they think the online learning is school. What can we do at home and what can school do to help children understand better the difference between the distance learning and the regular school? And, and I don't know if Louise wants to uh, come in at this point as well too, unless one of the psychs has got a, a response at this stage. Well, I thought this was an excellent question because when you think about it, I think um, Dr Middleton added up this is something like day or will be day 220 of lockdown since last year. So if you're a little year one, you have spent an awful lot of time last year and this year in lockdown. Um, Louise, did you want to comment about how can, how can we check that the children know that this isn't really what school is? There's elements that are, but there's other elements too. Off. That's not very frequent for me, having have not not having much to say. I was just going to say, how lucky are we to have two amazing psychologists at our school? Um, they're a wonderful support for students, but they're also a wonderful support for staff to help us help the students. So thank you, ladies, for all of your insights and. Um, and, and that's a great question because for a, a, quite a young child, when you know you get everything sorted and try and get them ready for the distance learning, um, when it initially started, many children would have been thinking, hang on, this isn't school. When I'm at school, it's a constant, it's predictable, it's my safe place, it's where I'm happy, it's where I go and it's what I do. And at school, that's where my teachers are and that's where my friends are. And at home, that's not school. So it's almost redefining what school is and redefining what learning is. And we get it as adults. But it's actually quite difficult for the children to come to that understanding. And so I think um, the mention earlier of the emotion coaching, I would take a very similar approach to that um, as a parent and talk to your child about um, how they're feeling. So when I recently had a meeting with my school captains, we just had lunch together and um, trying to help the children focus on the positives. We've got to be purveyors of hope throughout this. 
And so I talked to them about what are some of the positives of being at home and learning from home. And they told me all these things. They said, oh, you get to sleep in. I said, oh, you lucky things. Um, they said, oh, and one of them said, I can have my pet nearby as a comfort and I can't do that at school. Great one. I'm actually sometimes wearing my pyjama bottoms or I get to wear my slippers and or I get to have a longer breakfast. So they just talked about all the positives of being at home compared to being at school. And then we talked about what do you miss about school? And of course, they listed the obvious things. And so I think tuning into your children and having those conversations with them is really, really important. Um, of course, they miss school. They miss friends. They're social beings. And also when you're learning from home, especially if you have an only child, it's quite a solitary experience. At school, it's busy. You've got a friend to, to talk to next to you. You have group discussions. Sure, that can happen online, but it's not the same. And that's, in my mind, what the children are reacting to. This is not school because I have another idea and definition of what school is and an experience of what school is. It's also very hard, I'm sure, for you parents who are at home. You're, you're not the teacher and we don't expect you as as the teachers of the school, we don't expect you to replicate being a teacher, but to simply assist. And I've had lots of positive feedback from families about the way in which we're delivering the online learning. Um, we, we see the need for and have responded to connectivity and connecting, being there um, for the children, not only just teaching them, but being there quite often in the backgrounds, depending on the age and stage of the children, the teachers in the background, uh, maybe with their mic off and their camera off, and if a child needs a teacher, they can call out or put their hand up or whatever, and the teacher comes back in and helps them. So I think helping your child understand that um, the difference between distance learning, talking it through, as Bianca and Michelle have said, talk it through, not just, oh, it is school, it is school, talk it through um, and talk about the pluses of both and the things that they're probably not so happy about. Again, acknowledging those things is really, really important. If you're finding that your child's having great difficulty with the distance learning, as many of you have done, if needed, contact us. There was one occasion, or there've been a few occasions actually, when all that has been needed is that the classroom teachers had a chat with the child alone with the parent present and they've talked things through and they've talked about what it is that the child might be finding difficult. The other thing too I think is really important is that um, in being responsive to how your child's reacting is to take the pressure off. If your child is finding it really, really difficult and they're displaying some sort of distress, for example, you don't have to be doing every single activity. The teachers will understand, the teachers are fine. You can just readjust your expectations um, for what your child does in a day. Because I actually listened to a webinar last night by Dr. Michael Carr Gregg, and, um, and he, he actually said, one of his quotes was, we can catch up on the academic stuff, but you can't always catch up on the psychological stuff. So we have to give time and, and care to our children to and to acknowledge if they don't want to finish everything, we're not going to get cross. Um, just let us know, we're here to support you and things will go back to normal. Um, helping your children understand this is a temporary situation, being those purveyors of hope. Um, for the next Monday's assembly, I'm reading to the children a story called Windows and it's written about the coronavirus. And I actually discuss it with the children and I've said to them, you will come back to school. Not sure when, but you will come back to school. And giving your children those really positive, reassuring and reaffirming messages is going to help them navigate this temporary situation. Yeah, thanks, Louise. And, and yeah, that idea that this will end, um, it might be a little bit different later, but certainly we will be back at school. If I could make one further comment in response to that question, though, a lot of this is about language and what is happening in the distance learning, and you will have noted Louise referred to it as distance learning. It is distance learning, it is not homeschooling. 
homeschooling is a very, very different program. So in terms of when we are talking to our children, making sure that the language we use differentiates perhaps between um, what they're doing at home with you and what the situation is when they do actually return to school. So obviously we want them still to learn and we want them still to be happy, but it is not schooling per se. It is, um, it is distance learning or online learning, whichever you, you like to call it. Um, now, the, the next question that was sent through was about children experiencing, and I think it's not only children, a level of fatigue mid-term. We are week five, we are bang on halfway through term three, which in some ways seems crazy, but um, it's happened so fast in other ways, it's it's taking quite a long time. So given that, uh, that a lot of people, children and perhaps adults, have this sort of mid-term lull, what, uh, what can we do to help folk get through this, uh, that, yes, this typical midterm challenge, exas exacerbated by COVID, of course. I might do. Who are you wanting to answer that, Annette? Um, well, look, you know, I, I might throw this one open a little bit, everybody. Um, I might say Bianca, actually. What have you got any ideas? Um, I think often it's helping say that it's. You, you, you're halfway, you've only got the same amount again, it's not that much. And then there's holidays. Um, and then you get the break and it's planning forward. I think looking forward and planning for all the nice things that you can do when you don't have school um, can be a great way of seeing it. Um, I'm, I'm finding, I know this is um, about a lot of junior school families, but I'm finding the senior kids uh, really find term three hard um, because it's a hard slog. It's, it's getting towards the meaty end of the year. Um, and so term three is hard. Um, I think we're all particularly tired anyway. Um, just we're all, yeah, we're exhausted. Um, and midterm is always difficult, but it's, yeah, looking forward, looking forward to all the, all the fun things that you can do once you're on holiday. And am I right in saying, you know, giving us hope and, and being purveyors of hope, or I think that was the term Louise used, that's all very well, but do we not need to be really careful about what hope we, what things we suggest that the children look forward to just in case they don't happen? Should, uh, oh, should I think be it's, yeah. carefully? Yeah, definitely being realistic about it and having, having some plans, but knowing that, yeah, they can all get changed, but we'll find something fun to do instead. Mm -hmm. um, and it's and it's being open to that change, um, but providing something that they can look forward to, whether it is a trip to the zoo or whatever it happens to be that would be something that could happen most likely, um, or or if it's a big trip. But I mean, those things are possibly not on the cards. But um, yeah, there could be other things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, that is a nice little um, segue into the next question, which is about, it's probably more for the school, and I can certainly answer this one, about cancelled excursions and activities. Are they going to be rescheduled? The answer is absolutely, wherever possible. Obviously, subject to um, COVID guidelines, and depending on what the experience is, there may be some conditions on availability of the, the venue or, or whatever it is. But look, we, in many ways, uh, looking at across the school at all the events. We have, with the exception of the dead ball, which I think is up to rescheduling time number four, um, but other things have happened. We've got the musical in, we've got the um, 11 and 12 formal in, we've got various trips at different levels in, the Canberra trip for the junior school went ahead and so on. So look, we, we've probably been a little bit more adventurous than a lot of the other schools I'm in contact with who basically said, we're not gonna do anything until June, July. Uh, we, we've said, look, we're going to hope and try and do this. And, and we've been lucky in that some of the things have slipped into those little windows between lockdowns. Um, but obviously some things have had to be postponed, but it is our intent absolutely to give the children the full range of experiences that they, they normally do. Um, and linked to that, I know if you, um, Louise and I have been chatting about different types of activities for the children. If a teacher is sensing that their children might be coming disillusioned, disengaged, whatever it is, that they do sort of kind of stop things and go, all right, guys, what would you like to do now? So I know there's some deep thinking going on about certain days next week, and you'll probably find that, uh, and again, depending on the, uh, the particular classes, but that a number of the classes will be trying something 
quite different just for the day. There might be a much more um, increased focus on telling jokes or having having fun or whatever it is that might be. But the teachers, and I've checked this with the uh, wonderful psychs that are here, um, those, even the little ones are capable of saying what it is that they want more of, want less of, um, and uh, want to start doing. So I know that um, the teachers absolutely, because it's fairly new for them too, you know, they will do what needs to be done. Um, now we did receive some questions on transition returning to school and I remember um, chatting a little bit about this last year, Bianca, you might remember too. Um, hopefully we will be back at school basically next week, tomorrow week, fingers crossed, we should hopefully be back at school. If there is a child that is expressing some anxiety about returning to school, how might we as parents and school help them? Michelle, yeah, I think um, I guess it's just important to acknowledge that many kids will experience different feelings. So some might feel worried, um, but I would say many kids will feel really excited and happy. Um, and I would say that a lot of kids will feel tired um, as they adjust once again to the return to school and to the changes. Um, but yes, there are some kids who will feel nervous and maybe a bit reluctant um, about returning to school and just building on everything that we've been saying tonight. I think what's really important is just to talk with your child. If, if um, your child's feeling nervous, just to talk to them about um, what's happening um, and any possible changes, like for example, parents not being um, permitted on site, for example. So just talking them through what it will look like when they come back to school um, and just reminding um, your child that you're there for them if they ever want to talk about any challenges that they might be experiencing. Um, um, I did talk about this a bit earlier, but just um, I think it's really important for parents, for us as parents to create regular spaces or times in our day for conversations with our kids um, and for one-on-one -on -one time with our kids. And, and you might ask um, your child open-ended questions. Um, so maybe things like, you know, tell me some of the things that um, you're feeling worried about, or if they're back at school, tell me some of the things that might have been challenging. Um, and Louise and I, uh, we were speaking just this morning about using open-ended questions, and Louise had a really great one, which is help me to understand and I guess the most important thing um, for you and for you to do and for and really what your child really needs most if your child's feeling reluctant is to just listen um, and to just listen and reflect back what they're saying and to validate how they're feeling. Um, so if your child says, you know, it's hard being back at school, you might say, so it's hard for you right now. And I think what's really important um, when we're, uh, I think what's really important when I think about this is to always be sure to validate how our child is feeling before we jump into problem solving, um, which we can have a tendency to do as parents. We can dive into problem solving. Um, and the reason for this is that when we validate our children's feelings and when we reflect back how they're feeling, they really do feel seen and heard and understood and that's just so essential for their well-being. And I guess as well as listening to our kids, um, I think what's really important to remember is that, you know, we're, we're going through a really demanding and challenging time right now. Um, and one thing that we all need for our well-being at all times and especially right now and also as we then adjust back to going back to school is the opportunity to connect with other people. So I think it's really important now and when we return to school to really encourage and, and nurture um, your children's social relationships where possible. Um, you know, we, we're human beings and we're social creatures and connecting with other people is just so vitally important for our well-being, and it helps to decrease any stress that we might be experiencing and to increase our feelings of calm um, and also well-being. And, and just one other thing that I really think is important to mention tonight, um, and that is that, you know, as parents, sometimes we can focus on our children's well-being and neglect our own. Um, and I really want to just emphasise that 
you know, as all of you parents will know, um, we can only nurture our children's well-being to the extent that we're nurturing our own well-being as parents. Um, and the way that I like to think about it is that we can't pour from an empty cup. Um, so I think really now more than ever, um, now that we find ourselves in uh, lockdown six, I think it's really important that we focus on our own self-care as parents and make time to look after our own well-being. Um, and you all listening uh, this evening, you all, you all know what works best for you. Um, so it might include regularly making time to connect with your loved ones or exercising regularly or sleeping well and, and really just making time in your day for resting and for relaxation. Um, so I think I just want to end with, you know, that, that, you know, I think it's really important for us all to remember that we need to fill our own cup first. Mm. And, and wise words. Look, I know um, somebody is typing, but just while the question comes through, Bianca, yeah. I remember last year you had some really good practical hints if there was particularly a little child who was anxious about coming back to school, some physical things that the parents might do in the lead up to school return if they felt it necessary. Would you like to touch on those? Oh, I can't remember what my tips were. Oh, this is things like, you know, <laughs> driving by the school or let's talk about your teacher and that sort of thing. Yeah, I think I look, making connection with the teacher and letting the teacher know if your child is, is really worried about coming back to school, let them know because the teacher will be able to work out ways to engage them. Once, once you've got them physically back at school, they'll work out ways to really engage them and capture their interests so that they notice that... Um, that, that, or that realise that school is actually a really great place to be. And yes, it, it can be nerve wracking coming back into somewhere where you haven't been for a while and it can be a lot, feel awkward and uncomfortable, but it is a nice place to be. Um, and it, yeah, it's helping, like if your child is really nervous about coming back, this was at the end of the really long lockdown, um, we were talking about, yeah, do you drive, do a drive by of school so that you go, okay, that's the gate that I'm going to go in and that's where mum's going to wait for me or dad's going to wait for me. Um, just orient them back to the whole um, the whole process um, and get them used to what what the routine is again. Um, I also find in our household where where we make up our lunch boxes still um, because it, oh the amount of food that we go through is ridiculous. But because everyone's home and there's a fridge and there's a cupboard, but it's um, some of those sort of things as well. Get them used to using their lunchbox again if that's something that they're a bit worried about. Um, do some of those really regular, normal things that, that you used to do. Can yeah. I also add a couple of, a few things? I guess I'm just thinking that um, it can be really helpful and I guess building on what um, Bianca has been describing, it can be really helpful to be organised the night before. So to have the uniform all laid out, um, to do as many things as you can so that um, you're not pressed for time on the, the, the morning um, that you're coming into school. Um, I think it can also be really helpful uh, where possible, given the rules, um, to have opportunities to come together with some classmates, maybe at a playground if we're able to do that, um, just so that they have some casual time together with some of their classmates. Um, the other thing that I often suggest to parents um, if their children are feeling reluctant or worried about going to school, particularly the little ones, is to um, I describe it as giving a little piece of you. So this is the parent <laughs> to the child to take with them in their pocket. Um, so it might be um, something as simple as a, a lovely handkerchief that you have. So mum might have a handkerchief that's hers, a lovely little handkerchief or a, a little bit of a something um, that's associated with mum or is to do with mum or dad. Um, and the child can then take it with them in their pocket. So they've just got that to carry with them throughout their day. Um, I can also recommend, there's a great book, well, there's lots of different books. Um, one's called The Invisible String. Um, and that book is all about the fact that it's a children's book, The Invisible String, and it's all about um, the fact that no matter what, we're connected, even when we're apart, um, we're connected. Um, so that's a lovely book to read to primary school age children um, if they're feeling nervous about being separated um, from mum and dad. Well, I was, can I just say I once had a student when I was teaching and she had a little necklace with a little dolphin. Her mum had the same dolphin 
and yeah. she would rub it. She would rub it when she was anxious, and yeah. everyone would see her do it, but she would just be sitting there, and it really made a difference. That's a great suggestion. I've seen it work. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Look, there's some very um, lovely comments coming through. One thing I will say is we have recorded tonight, and the link will be shared with the broader community um, in the next day or so. So please, uh, if you do, hear of other people who may, may have not been able to attend, please reassure them that uh, they will be able to hear what has been said. The other thing that we'll do is a number of books have been mentioned. What we might do, if that's all right, is um, if I can get a list of those books and we'll put them in the Friday comms, the Friday community uh, communication that goes out from my office every day, every Friday, sorry, and uh, they, that will be, oh, it actually has almost been every day during COVID, but um, that will be there for people um, to refer to if, uh, and hopefully that that will help. Um, I guess the sort of key things is that the key thing is that this will end and we will get through it, and we I believe will be stronger. We will certainly be much more flexible and um, you've many of you have heard me say before that I think one of the most important 21st century skills even prior COVID to COVID was being comfortable with being uncomfortable and if we can do that and teach our children and, and perhaps help them to come out with that particular attribute I think uh, I think we uh, will have succeeded in many ways so look I'm unless there's any more questions I think people are quite happy now to go and um, enjoy whatever else the evening holds. I will say, as always, reach out if you have further questions. None of us are going anywhere, let's be honest. We'll be really, really happy to answer any further questions that come through if you want to email them through to principal at St Margaret's Berwick Grammar School. Um, and we can uh, certainly post um, some responses depending on the nature of the question, but very happy to do them as an FAQ on a public site, um, public part of our website or whatever. So big thank you for attending. Um, we are all in this together. Huge thank you to Michelle and Bianca and Louise and other staff members that are here and particularly to all you parents. Good luck, good night and look after yourselves particularly. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.